that's a question that, that strikes right to the heart of the question of the origin of the first life. How do you get the information that's necessary to build? Steve, how many, maybe a hard question to answer, but when we look at the bacterial flagellum, that's just one example of an irreducibly complex system. How many systems are inside a living thing that could be considered irreducibly complex? I mean, just because you might come up with a possible way of explaining it naturally, uh, one irreducibly complex system doesn't mean you've explained all of the irreducibly complex systems. So how many different systems in a, in a living thing would be irreducibly complex or could be or appear to be? Well, um, I, uh, first I'd stipulate that no uh, gradual Darwinian step-by-step -step, uh, processes have sufficed to explain any irreducibly complex system. Mm -hmm. So I, I wouldn't concede even the premise of the question. Mm -hmm. uh, the best uh, such proposal that has been made has been this type three secretory system as the precursor. And I've only touched on an, a, a couple of the problems with, with, that, with that proposal. Um, but it turns out, I mean, this is one of the big discoveries of modern uh, biochemistry, molecular biology, molecular genetics, is that at the foundation of life, you have mul many multiples uh, of systems, nano, various types of nanomachines, circuitry, information processing systems. I've worked principally on the question of the origin of the genetic information that's necessary to build the proteins and the protein machines that keep cells alive. And therefore, that's a question that, that strikes right to the heart of the question of the origin of the first life. How do you get the information that's necessary to build even a simple one-celled mm. organism? Mm. That has turned out to be an insoluble problem in origin of life research. Even le they're, they're le leading people in chemical evolutionary theory themselves acknowledge that, that, that we really are nowhere on explaining that. And yet we know from experience and what, uh, that whenever we find information, as to when we find it in a digital form, as we find it at the foundation of life in the DNA molecule and RNA molecules, uh, whenever we find information and we trace it back to its source, whether we're talking about a hieroglyphic inscription or a paragraph in a book or information embedded in a radio signal, we always find that that information arose from a mind, not an undirected process. So that's a, sort of the, the, the foundational argument for intelligent design. But then that information makes these uh, irreducibly complex systems. The, the information encodes for their construction through very complex uh, kind of uh, assembly uh, routines that themselves have a kind of irreducible complexity to them. But anyway, back to your original question, there are... Um, Many of these irreducibly complex molecular machines, we have several animated on my website, the ATP synthase, the, the machine that makes the uh, ATP molecules that store the energy that all cells need to power metabolic processes and reactions. Uh, there, there are robotic walking motor proteins, um, kinesin, and they, they walk like on two legs on these long tracks uh, that are essentially uh, functioning like railroad tracks inside the cell you know, for all the automated fact, you know, kind of factory functions that it performs. And the, the uh, kinesin t tows these vesicles along the tracks and the vesicles contain materials that are needed in other places within the cell. Um, there are other, um, there are turbines, there are um, um, in, the, in the process of DNA replication, there are little machines that look like that look like sliding clamps. The uh, biology at the molecular level is full of these sophisticated nano machines that are clearly accomplishing uh, even mechanical processes that are discernible to a mechanical engineer. The flagellar motors are fascinating because it has, as Scott mentioned, a rotor, a stator, U joints, bushings, a drive shaft, a clutch. <laughs> <laughs> um, on a miniaturized scale, some of the, st the, the, the systems that Scott works on can tr change direction on a quarter of a turn and, and rotate at 1,000 RPM. They're, they've been said to be the most efficient machines ever discovered, yet they're in the cell membrane of a one-celled bacterial organism. So I like to say they're high-tech and low-life. So this has been a huge revolution in molecular genetics and biochemistry, molecular biology, the discovery of this nano machinery at the foundation of life. And it complements the discovery of, of the code because the, it, just like if, you, you know, if you're 
uh, your viewers are thinking about uh, an analogy to computers, if you want to give your computer a new function, you've got to give it new code. And the same thing turns out to be true in life. If you want to build a, a molecular machine, if you want to build a circuit, and there are many, there's all kinds of circuits that control animal development. If you want to build an information processing system, you've got to have code. And uh, and so that if you want to build the first life, you've got to have code, just like in our computer world. So that's the ultimate question: Where does that information come from? But we also see these striking indicators of design and engineering in what the information builds, namely these nanomachines and circuitry.